Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. I'm Wayne Tuttle, once again, your host for another Monday afternoon of thrills and chills and whatever else is about to come. Before we get any further, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell to know when our videos are coming up, Mondays, Fridays. But still, you get an alert and know that there's a new one up, just in case something would unusual happen and we miss one. Um, likewise, go down and leave a comment if you want to. We always like them. We always answer them. We always keep them. Um, in the about section, you can go to represent.com. You can get a shirt like this, Legend of the Superstition Mountains. You can get a coffee cup like this, Legend of the Superstition Mountains. And possibly soon, hats like these, Legend of the Superstition Mountains. Or the Dutch Hunter Rendezvous, coffee cups and hats. Just, hey, just either one, what you want. Go ahead, pick them. They're really nice. So... So let's continue on with this week's Chasing Legends episode. So now that we've put all that foolishness beside and trying something ridiculous there, then hopefully everybody enjoyed that. Let's get into this week's story. We did the maps and we did some stuff and we are taking what you asked and we got a list of things and we will be getting to them alternately. We also have stories and we have some other history we'll want to present this week. There was a story I thought of the other day. This would happen. I first heard of it in the mid-90s to late 90s. Didn't act upon it till the early 2000s. A gentleman's name is Frank. It is not Frank Augustine. He's a different person named Frank. He was an older gentleman, but not Frank Augustine. But this Frank, he was going out in the mountains and hiking and stuff, and I ran across him. And he talked about, we, we got in a conversation, and somehow the conversation got in the Superstition Mountains. And the thing was, we both really enjoyed and talked about the book, The Killer Mountains, by Kurt Gentry and Glenn McGill's um, treasure hunt up in the mountains. So we're discussing it all. One of the points of discussion was he had been out, and I have likewise back in the 80s, but we talked about the trail that Glenn McGill seems to make reference to that would be on the east side of Bluff Springs on the Labarge side, and that no one's really been able to locate it. I think Tom Collinborn found a couple spots, but he said it really... Couldn't tell if it was a game trail or for what it had been, but no one could find this reference that Glenn McGill had made that there had been some trail on the eastern side of Bluff Springs because generally that trail is on the southwest side and goes up the southern route and then comes up on the ends up on the southwest end of Bluff Springs, the Ely Anderson Trail. So we talked about it a bit, and he said he'd found something up there. He'd been looking for years, you know, he would go in and he said his favorite trip was he would make the trip to Charlie Boy and he would spend the night. Now he had to be in his, well when he did this he was probably in his 60s or 70s. When I met him he was quite a bit older and he hadn't been really going out as much. But he said when he came to Arizona um, he would take the hikes and he liked to go out to Charlie Boy. And he really wasn't a treasure hunter or anything like that, but he'd read the book and he wanted to explore this. So he was going through there, and what he would do is look at a section of the mountain, and he would go up and try to find areas. He could go up Bluff Springs on that side and look to see if he could find any sign where there had been a trail, um, any type of artifact, anything laying around, anything to give him any. Because that side of the mountain, there's just not much give where you would think you would find anything. And Glenn McGill gives kind of a description of where it was. The trail was completely blown out. And, all. and it sounds more similar to the Ely Anderson to some degree. But he really makes the point that it's on the east side of Bluff Springs. So Frank had been doing this off and on. And he said he'd been out there one time. And it was before he'd hit Holmes Springs. And there was an area he went up in. And he said he went up to this one spot. He was just working his way around. And he said it was really kind of odd because once he got up in there... He got by some, there was some bigger boulder rock outcroppings. And as he got back and he was looking and kind of not trying to, he really couldn't find a way to go forward or up any further. And he kind of, not cliffed out, but kind of boxed out. And he said he turned and he saw an opening. And he said the opening was maybe only about three feet high and about three feet wide. And he said he looked over and it was kind of odd. And he said it was kind of one of those things where, you can't see it except really from one angle. Now there was a 
whether it was a tree, a bush, or something, there was something that kind of kind of kept it hidden, but it was also kind of at an angle. So he said you literally had to be turned and getting ready to leave, but not fully turned. You had to be kind of, as you turned, you would catch your eye. And he looked over and he said it was very difficult to get to. He had to kind of go down and back up and around to get to it. And even then, he kept thinking it was one of those things, and I know anybody who's been out in the mountains, especially the superstitions, you'll think, well, there's something here. I saw it, and it seems to take forever, and you keep going, well, where is it? it it's got to be here. And you keep looking and looking, and it's just, and then it finally is there. He said he got there, and he wasn't quite sure what to make of it because it was an opening. He said it had been rocked up, but not rocked like, in the waltz tale where Walt said, oh, there was this tunnel and I walled it up, he said it actually had some sort of mortar or caliche in the rocks. And it had a frame of a door, but he said at the bottom, he didn't understand why at the time, and I told him what I thought. But um, it had about a wall that was probably, I got my hand out of camera frame, but uh, it was probably about two feet high at the bottom. And he said that puzzled him because he couldn't understand it. It was like he'd have to stoop down. And then he said, you know, the difficulty is not only when you're stooping down to get into something like that, but you got to step over something. And he said there wasn't much of a ledge to it, maybe two, three feet. You had a very, very tight spot to stand on. And it was solid rock, he said. But he said he kind of got inside of it, and then it opened up after maybe only three or four feet. He said it didn't go very far, and then it just opened up into kind of a larger open room spot. Um, the floor, he said, it looked like they'd leveled it out with dirt or sand or something, and it was actually kind of flat. He thought, wow, it, it's not a mine. He said he, he couldn't really rationalize whether it was a cave or a mine. He said the um, open interior part was probably eight or ten feet by about eight or ten feet. And he said it was probably only about five feet high. He said you had to stoop um, the whole time you're in there, he said, which was a pain. It was easier to get down on your knees. He said there was no snakes. And that's what I mentioned to him is that the entrance probably was so no snakes, any other crit or something would be kind of difficult. Um, a lot of animals, they wouldn't want to go over that little two-foot bump, jump over and get in there. So it would be kind of give you a, a, kind of a safe zone perhaps. Now, usually you see those in springs. And I asked that question. I said, was there any moisture, anything moist? And he said, no, there was no moisture, no sign of moisture, nothing in there. He looked at all the walls, looked for petroglyphs. He looked for any kind of smoke stain. He said there was just nothing in there. And he visited it two or three times. He said he never found a single artifact, nothing in there. So um, he told me the story, kind of jotted down, and I think it was on a napkin. And someday I'll have to pull out some boxes of old stuff I got and see if that got that napkin still. But kind of told me where he thought, you know, about where it would be and all. And that was all I thought about it. And this is, like I said, mid-90s, late-90s. So sometime in the early 2000s, I'm heading out, and I was going to run up, and I wanted to check... I was going out in Bluff Springs, and I wanted to check home springs in a couple spots. Um, and it was just like one of those hikes where I wasn't necessarily looking for anything, but I thought, I'll go back and kind of check that whole Bluff Springs thing and find what he had written down. So I wrote it out on a piece of paper, which wasn't much, but so I could take that along in my pocket and go out and kind of look for it. And I had no luck whatsoever. Every spot that I thought kind of fit his description, I would go up into... I didn't find anything like the little bit of an arroyo or what he was talking about, which I don't know. He didn't use the term arroyo, but he said it was a little kind of like a narrowing area. And every time I thought I saw something kind of very similar, I would walk around, turn around, look, there'd be just nothing like it. And I spent pretty much three or four hours just up and down in these spots because he said it wasn't very far. It was only took him about 15, 20 minutes to get to the point where he was able to look over and then he saw it. So it wasn't, he said it wasn't this, it was difficulty. It was difficult to get up into it and everything, but where he could put his eyes on it. And he was only probably 15 or 20 minutes from where he had left the trail or started up the ascent on Bluff Springs. Never, never ran into him again. He was, he was older when I met him. Like I said, he could have been in his seventies, maybe his early eighties. And it was just one of those things where you meet someone and you just get into a conversation which you know sometimes you do you have a conversation with someone and they bring something up and you go oh yeah and then the conversation continues on and it was one of those i was very fortunate to meet him 
I'm, I don't know of anybody I've ever met that has ever said anything like it. Now, he never found the trail. I've never found any sign or anything concerning the trail. I've talked to so many people that have looked for that. Um, I even talked to um, Baker Looney about it a bit, a bit and he was kind of never gave me a real answer on it. He said there was stuff in the book that really didn't happen and this and that, but he didn't give me a direct answer to that because that was one of the things I wanted. Well, just give me a direct answer. Was there a possibility of a trail there or wasn't there? Was that completely fictitious in the book or not? And he didn't give me that exact answer So, because it was one of those things I wanted to check off at the time too since I'd looked for this spot. And I think me and him talked briefly, and I mentioned this story a little to him. This was at a rendezvous, I think, with Baker. It's probably 2007, 8, 9, somewhere around there. So and I, it was very nice to meet him at the time. We didn't get a lot of time to talk, but there was a the few times I did, I had questions. And then there was things I wanted to talk to him about. Did you guys ever see this or that while you were up there? So it's a very interesting story. So like I said, it's about a three-foot by three-foot opening. Um, the sides, he said, were like a foot or so of rock with like caliche or something. And he said it was mortared in and he said it was kind of almost squared. And he said the bottom, there's about a two foot raised spot. So he said there's an opening into it. It makes you think a little bit of like a spring when you come up to, upon a spring up in the mountains. But he said there was nothing that showed any sign that there had been moisture or anything in there. It looked more like a place someone had to set camp. Um, he'd also explored the area, and he said he never saw any sign of any prospecting, any claim markers, anything old trail or anything leading out of there make, make you think that it was being used much. Was it a watch point for someone at some time where they were watching the trails below? He said it didn't have a great clear vision of anything, kind of looking southeast. So he said it just, it didn't make sense, you know. He said it, it, it didn't fit anything. Was it a place they were stashing something and came back? He said even then it would have been so difficult to get to and very limiting because he said really if you had two, three people there, you would have to only let one person at a time go over, go in, then the next person would have to come over. He said there wasn't really room out front of it for two or three people to even stand. He said it was very, very tight. So it's an interesting thing if you're ever between somewhere between Bluff Springs and Holmes Springs and you're on that area of Bluff Springs Mountain and you start working your way up and down, keep your eye out as you after you ascend up, as you go to turn, not after you've turned, but as you turn, always keep your eye open to see if you catch a little glimmer of something because it should still be there. Could be covered by foliage at this point, you know, that tree might be open. But it would be interesting for someone else today to find it and still give it a closer and another look and for all of us to kind of see what it is. Um, the fact that he'd found it and we have to figure it had to be, he had to have found it somewhere between the mid 70s and mid 80s. And at that time it had been long deserted and he said it looked like it had been there, you know, a long time. But he said, you know, again, he was very clear it's made of rock. Who knows? It could have been made six months before him, but it didn't seem to. So who knows what that meant and what that was all about. Now, I hope you enjoyed this story this week because it's not a story that kind of reveals a lot, but it gives everybody something to look for. It's not a hard hike. Going off the Peralta Trailhead, uh, make your way out towards Miner's Needle, come up over Miner's Needle, go through Bluff Springs, and then just take hook your way around and go up towards like you're going to Charlie Boy. And somewhere between Bluff Springs and Home Springs, there should be that spot somewhere on your left as you're going up through there. Um, very cool. I know there's a couple caves in there that fit the description, but he was very clear. It was stones, and he said it looked like it had been caliche or mortar of some sort put on the sides. And he said it wasn't like mud adobe. He said it held very well. And he said it was very purposeful, and it was placed there for a reason. But he couldn't figure out the reason. And none of us sometimes are experts when we see that sort of thing. If you happen to get out there and you find it, let us all know. Give us some direction. Give us some coordinates or give us a clue. Give us a map. A map that we can go out and treasure hunt on. Or perhaps it's a great cache, you know. Put a six-pack of beer in there and tell everybody next guy up gets a cold beer. Because it should be pretty, eh, I don't know. Those places are generally kind of damp and warm. Anyhow, that's it for this week. Dutch Hunter Rendezvous coming up first week in November. So remember that. Put that on there on your calendars and our guest speaker this year from Jacob's Trail. No, not Jacob's Trail, the Dutchman's Trail, the second book, but he'll have copies of both, so you can get both and sign them, and then you can read them both. But Jesse Feldman, and we could use his author name, Jesse James Feldman. And I'll be touching base with him, because not only before the rendezvous, I want to sit down and talk to him and do something with him, 
before he gets out to do that, to post it afterwards to help him with his book. Because I want to be able to talk what, how he's promoting his book, how he's selling his book. I know the hardcovers are supposed to be available soon, or if not now. And kind of help him sell some books and move some books. Because you write it for share it with people who have a, a common interest or an interest in the subject matter. So I'll see what we can do there. They should be available at the rendezvous, I would hope, any copies that he does have. And I'm sure he's more than happy to sign them. If not, we'll force them to sign them for everybody. So that being said, like I said, we got the shirts. We got the coffee cups. We're looking at the hats. We're not super thrilled with the hats. We're going to look at other designs. But one of the big things on all this type of stuff is we're trying to keep the cost down. I'm not trying to like really just take you for a ride for 30 40 bucks for a hat. Um, I tend to look at something and go, you know, the hats I ended up with, it was because I looked over and I said, oh, they're on clearance. They're going to discontinued item. Hmm. And it was like 15 bucks, so I grabbed one, and then I grabbed two. And then after I did the show, I realized I really like the hats. Frank hates them, but I like the hats. They're very comfortable. They've lasted well for me. But since they're discontinued, I went back out, and they were discontinued even more. It was like 10 bucks a pop. So I bought a few more just to have backups because the horror was on towards the end of filming is the hat blew off once up on above Fish Creek Hill, and it almost went off the cliff. And I yelled at the cameraman and audio guys, you better grab that hat because that's the only one. And everybody started just scurrying. You know, we almost lost a guy over the edge because they had to get the hat because once the hat was gone, we we're going to have to switch hats completely on the show. And they don't like to do that. So that hat at that point had kind of its own little thing. So they're all, And they all break in a little different. So each one of them is a little different. But um, that being said and done, sorry, second story, bonus story, okay? But thank you for joining us again. Thank you for joining us on the Friday Lives. We'll try to do something again this week, and I'll try to kind of cook up something special. Um, I don't like to announce it because things do fall through. we got a lot to do. And what we're going to be doing this weekend, um, prior to the Chasing Legends, is working on the episode OTFs and a lot of our little interview footage and stuff and start compiling stuff together because I know everybody's looking forward to that stuff and Frank and I have been talking about it all this material we've put together and we want to put it together in such a way it's going to be uniquely different as the season one on history was and then two three and four on YouTube were we want this to even be different than that we want this to be something that you really can sink your teeth in and you're going to pull a lot of knowledge out we don't want it to be repetitive we want it to be something really concise and you're going to sit there and you're going to hear it. we're not going to reference things we're going to let you hear about the history and what we pulled out and what our concerns are and stuff so you're going to get the research in as much as everything else so I think everybody should look forward to those as we get closer and closer to pushing that stuff out this fall. I know it's been a long time coming, but I think it's going to be worth the wait. And maybe we'll have some new stuff, like a new intro. New intro would be nice. It's kind of getting old now, but pushing something new. So thank you again for joining us here at Chasing Legends on Mondays. Okay, remember, every Monday. And until the next time, I hope everybody takes care. They have an awesome week. And always remember, I'm Wayne Tuttle, and you're not. Thanks for watching, and take care.